Really, I think everyone will agree we've got a great lineup of lectures today. There's something here for everybody, I think. Um, and uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you to Sarah and to, to David for, for putting together such a, a great collection of lectures for us. If we now move on to um, our lectures for the day, um, and the first one's given by Adrian Worcester, um, and of course he's talking about uh, a, a lack of copper in the world, I believe. So, um, Adrian, you're here, yes. Um, Adrian heads up the strategy function for the wholesale and infrastructure half of Giga Clear PLC. In the long distance past, he had a background in network architecture, but now focuses on rapidly reforming policy and regulatory space and how strategy supported by technology can be used to help scale and position operators to make the most of full fibre future. So if I can introduce you to Adrian. Try to approach this. We've, you know, the Chancellor's announced that we're now going to have a full fibre future. The government seems intent on it. So I thought what I'd do is look at it from two perspectives. One from rural startup and how we approach this kind of thing. And then actually then look at whether the um, policy regulatory environment is actually supportive towards a copper switch off. Um, for those of you who don't know, GigaClear was founded by Matthew Hare in 2010 um, as a company that was trying to solve the broadband for his own house. Um, he lived in rural Oxfordshire, had pretty poor broadband um, and had just sold his business, was told, well, if you can't fix your broadband, who can? So GigaClear was founded. We only do rural and we only do full fibre, point-to-point fibre, uh, which makes us somewhat unusual. Um, you may have picked up in the news this year, though, that we're embarking on the next chapter. Um, Matthew exited the business. He's decided we're at the end of that entrepreneurial phase, and we're now wholly owned by, or pretty much wholly owned by, Infra Capital, which is the Prudential's infrastructure investment arm, and the Railway Pension Fund. So there's a whole new chapter starting up in the company now. Give you some indication of where we are in the business. Um, we've currently got about 70,000 properties passed um, with another 350,000 scheduled. Um, to give a sort of perspective on the difference between a typical um, urban build and a rural build, uh, we average around 50 to 60 metres between customers um, rather than the sort of 8 to 12, I guess, that many urban projects will deal with. And 20,000 kilometres, I understand, would get you from here to Wellington, New Zealand. Um, so that's quite a trench that we're having to dig. Um, and the ambition is to lift that up to more like a million um, properties over the coming years. So for ambition, if you like, it, certainly for a rural operator. Um, as a new entrant, I think, if we tried to scale the traditional way, we'd find that incredibly difficult. Um, 
You know, even if we wanted to find all those designers, planners, surveyors and everything, we would need vast numbers of them in an enormous office block. Um, so we tried to approach this as a startup should approach it. So, for example, we've, um, I'm going to talk a bit more about this. We've started to use AI-based automated design tools. Um, we try to innovate um, in the way we actually build the networks, the construction techniques, but we'll talk a bit about that later as well. And we're innovating quite heavily in the way that we do our surveying. We use a lot of things like 3D LiDAR vehicles, that kind of thing. So the automated design, um, we started to look at some of the tools that you can buy off the shelf. Um, that help with automated designs. And I think one of the challenges we found was that they're fantastic if you live in Milton Keynes. Great on nice, gridded, urban environments. And as soon as you throw a quite a complex, sparse, rural area at them, a lot of these tools just collapse in a heap. We ended up actually developing our own in-house. So unusually for a strategy team in, in a telco, we've got data scientists, mathematicians, and geospatial guys in my team, as well as the usual policy and regulatory type functions. So that's now incorporating quite a lot of smart maths, machine learning, AI. We're now forging links with a number of universities to take that further. And then over the summer, we migrated it into the Amazon cloud. And we're now able to design at a rate of about 100,000 properties an hour. Now. What that means is that when you're in rural areas, you get all sorts of problems with demographics, geology, um, highways problems, all sorts of things. And um, using this kind of scale means that you can run lots and lots of scenarios before you pick the one that you actually want to, to build. Um, in fact, over the summer, we got to a point where Amazon phoned us up and asked us to rein back a bit because we'd eaten most of their London data center. Surveying was the same issue. You know, a typical cabinet build of about 400 houses is somewhere between 20 and 40 kilometers. Um, so to send surve traditional surveyors out there, they've first of all got to do an awful lot of walking. And what, but when they come back, all they're going to have is a notebook of all the oddities, you know, the engineering difficulties, where the verge doesn't exist, that kind of thing, and not capture a complete picture. Now. Whether we do it automated or whether we do it manually, the planning process is typically based off of ordnance survey data, aerial imagery, that kind of thing. None of which is, well, first of all, it's all two-dimensional. And secondly, it's often not that up-to-date. Um, so we've built one of these. Um, and underneath that cab at the back is what looks a bit like the Google Street View type equipment, except it's doing not just 360 degree HD imagery, it's also doing all millimeter accurate LiDAR. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to turn into Theresa May from last year, I think. Um, as, as well as having you know, ground penetrating LiDAR to go and manually go over the bridges and make sure that we understand them properly, this is now capturing the entire route we, instead of doing um, one cabinet district every few days, we're now doing three or four a day. Um, so a massive improvement in productivity. But when they come back to the office, it means that the planners, when they're verifying the designs, have everything that they need to look at. So as well as confirming mapping data, it also does things like uncover hidden ditches and banks. One of the great things about LiDAR is you can strip away all the vegetation. And you can see whether that hedge is actually hiding a bank or whether there are drainage ditches in the, in the um, roadside. One of the other key things is that it also picks up where the scars in the roads are. So one of our common problems is that we get the stats the information coming back from water companies and the like, and they'll say, there's a, a mains water going down the middle of the road. And it's not until you arrive there do you realize it's actually down the side of the road. And with this, we're able to identify the scars automatically. And in fact, we're building that into the next round of AI development so that when we get the data back, it gets fed straight into the automated design and gets rerun 
to try and adjust for where there are banks, ditches, and known utility um, pipes and so on. The other thing, I think this is a questionable innovation. I think for UK highways, this is quite innovative. Um, if you were to go to much of Europe or America, it's pretty old hat. Um, we pretty much exclusively in the carriageway do narrow trenching and increasingly looking at micro trenching. Um, these pictures are from a demonstration day we held um, earlier in the year for local highways groups to come and have a look at. And um, that highlighted quite some interesting differences of opinion. Um, we had uh, two guys from a county council that will remain nameless. Uh, what we did was we, we trenched a piece of land. We um, used a number of different uh, backfill techniques, you know, recycling materials. We used foam concrete and so on. Then different surface dressing with resins and so on. And one guy from this particular council turned around and said, I really like that foam concrete. His colleague said, not on my day, you won't. And essentially, what they were saying was, depending on who was, who was actually in the office the day we put our notices in, would depend what method statement we could submit. So this isn't just different councils. This is different people within the same council. So, but if we can use these new techniques, we're finding that narrow trenching, particularly in rural areas, is maybe five times quicker. If we can use the newer reinstatement techniques, we're able to close a road after rush hour and have it reopened again in the evening, which if you think about rural areas, the diversion works could be huge. You could have 20 miles round trip to get around a road closure. And if we're allowed, it means that we can often have rolling roadworks and not have to close roads much at all. Similarly, the excavation, where you have to take the, um, the excavated material, take it off site, and then bring clean in to, to reinstate. Well, narrow trenching, that's typically about a 75% reduction. And we've now got some techniques that allow us to reprocess the excavated material on site and use it as the fill, which means that about 95% of the material never leaves the site. Now, in an urban area, that's quite useful. In a rural area, where some of the roads won't take the big diesel lorries that need to take the material away, where you're having to put a lorry several miles down the road with dump trucks toing and froing, this is a huge benefit. But again, not all the local highways authorities like it. So, some headaches still remain. You know, if you look at a typical area, there's a whole variety of permitting, noticing, road rental schemes going on. And one of the things we're finding increasingly is that hard pressed local authorities are seeing permitting schemes as a revenue opportunity. Different techniques can we narrow trench? Do we have to? dig it manually with a bronze spoon, you know, all these different issues that we're having to deal with. And then typical ones of who actually owns the verge? Do we need a way leave or is it part of our permitted rights? Quite complicated. So to sort of sum up the first bit of the presentation, if you're delivering in rural, you need smart and fairly brave investors, designers, surveyors, you need to revisit all your build techniques and you need the people to support it. But what you also need is quite a supportive government that actually understands this. And you know, I think when you... No one has ever had to dig up the entire country as one project, which is what the government's now proposing. 27 million fibre connections over the next decade or so. That needs quite a supportive government to make sure this works. So... Do we have a supportive environment? So, I think I, I've been in rural British broadband for probably about 15, 16 years now. Um, several governments. Um, at various times we've had ministers with a vision but no strategy. 
strategy and no vision, tactics but not neither of the above. Um, and I think recently, I think it would be fair to say when Matt Hancock took over the portfolio, it was the first time that it felt like all three were aligning at the same time. So last year at London's Broadband World Forum, he stood up and said, the future is fibre. Um, that was the first time we had a sort of nice, clear, unequivocal statement about where the country was heading. But they then followed through with a strategic approach with the major infrastructure review over the summer. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's about an inch thick document that's not long been published. Quite dense insight in there. Um, focusing on how we make the migration to a full fibre and 5G environment. Looking at some of the structural problems that you know, way leaves and all those other things that are still holding us back. Also committing to somewhere in the order of three to five billion pounds of additional funding over the coming terms, um, specifically for full fibre. And at last taking an outside in approach, which means that they're going to start with the really rural areas first, the ones where there genuinely is no commercial case for delivering, and work forward. And the great benefit of that is it allows commercial entities to work out what it is they want to build before the government steps in and tells you how you're going to build. It's much better, much smarter. But also what's happening is they've set up a number of tactical programs. So um, the barrier busting team in DCMS um, have been um, fantastically useful. Um, if any of you have problems with noticing way leaves and all these sorts of things, it's worth getting in touch. We've had, so for example, where we've had local authorities that we think are behaving a little unfairly in the way that they're doing a permitting scheme, DCMS has been very quick to come and help and sort of broker a common sensible path through that. And we've had um, good success with working with DCMS on that. Also, they've now put in place the USO, so the secondary legislation was passed earlier in the year, which is giving householders legal right to at least 10 megabits per second with a glide path to much higher speeds. That's now been passed to Ofcom, and Ofcom are now consulting on exactly how that's going to be at work, but not as a, a BT-centric thing, but as an industry-wide thing. And then the, the, the euphemistic all-IP working group, um, which is actually about switching off the analog telephone network. So the intention is that by 2025, you will not be able to make an old-fashioned analog telephone call, um, that you will only be able to make IP telephone calls. It's quite a significant step, but um, all work in progress. And then the Chancellor stood up at the CBI dinner this year and announced that not only was the country going to be full fibre, but that we were now, um, it was going to be an inefficient market if we maintain both copper and fibre networks at the same time. <coughs> so they're now starting to formally talk about, in policy circles, a copper switch-off. But this is a much more complex market than we've ever had before. You know, if you divide it into sort of urban and rural and fixed and wireless, <coughs> I've already said that we're a full fibre rural operator, but of course, you know, the, the traditional operators of OpenReach, Virgin and KCOM still exist, and they're still rolling out. But you've got urban upstarts as well. Community fibre, hyperoptic, city fibre, and TalkTalk. TalkTalk talk. Talk are now looking at creating an infrastructure company. You've then got a few specialists like Warren Net and Bridge Fibre, who in these cases particularly look at rural business parks and the like, and they, they are only interested in business connectivity. And then you have the rural operators. Bigger Clear isn't the only rural operator, we're by far the biggest. But you've also got Cool Flow, you've got True Speed, and of course you've got the famous community project of Barn up near Lancaster. And then there's a whole raft of wireless operators out there, some of which, like County Broadband, have now secured funding to start migrating to fibre as well. This is a much, much more complex market than we've traditionally had. So regulation can't have be a, a sort of private dance with 
BT anymore. It needs to be a much broader mm -hmm. market perspective. But this creates something of a bit of, of a conundrum. The government wants the entire country fivered up. 27 million properties. But if you just leave it to the market to decide, you could end up with 27 million connections, but in 9 million homes. You know, the urban 9 million will get three connections each. Um, and if the industry alone then says, well, actually, that's not efficient, we could be accused of collusion if we start carving the market up ourselves. So there is a, a role for government and regulator to try and help us make sure that this is an efficient rollout, that we don't have excessive overbuilding unless it's you know, commercially, competitively possible. Um, we'll see how that develops. I know that there's some talk within policy circles about how that might work, but it's, it's quite a fine line to tread, particularly in such a new market. And I think that Ofcom has hinted that we could return to sort of that three market model. If you remember back to the ADSL days, there were telephone exchanges with lots of unbundling, no unbundling, and a bit of unbundling, the Ofcom market one, two, three model. And I think we could be heading in that sort of direction again, where we have the very deep urban, deeply rural, and the bit in between, where in the urban, it's perfectly possible to support two, three, four fiber operators in exactly the same footprint. We're already starting to see some of that with hyperoptic virgin and so on in the same areas. Then at the other extreme, you've got those rural areas where um, certainly no more than one operator could exist. And in some cases, it's not even viable for one without some form of subsidy. And then there's that bit in the middle where the market may support more than one. Competition may grow up, but it might not. And that needs a sort of watching brief. But they probably need quite different regulatory environments. Um, when Ofcom responded to Future Telecom's infrastructure review, they hinted that in these deeply competitive areas, it may conceivably be possible to allow OpenReach to start having um, retail relationships again, directly be much more vertically integrated. Now, I actually suspect that that was a dig at Virgin and some of the vertically integrated operators and is not something that will actually happen, but it's the sort of language that's now being used. But then at the other end, you're in an area where any company investing in purely deep rural broadband probably has a natural monopoly. And that's not good for consumer choice, so I suspect we're going to see a different set of regulations in there. And this is quite a balancing act. So urban specialists, the hyper optics, the community fibers and so on, typically focus on things like MDU buildings, where there's a very low cost of ac customer acquisition. They also tend to have vertical integration, which means that they're capturing the whole revenue stream. In contrast, BT has to set a national average wholesale price. So these guys can always undercut BT if they choose to. Now, actually, while competition develops, that's probably not a bad thing, but it's probably not sustainable. And as Ofcom has already hinted that they could lead to less regulation, but that regu less regulation could lead to BT dropping its prices in, in, rural, in urban areas. Now, if they do that, that has a knock-on effect at the other end of the spectrum. If BT is allowed to drop its prices in urban, it's probably going to push prices up in rural areas. And it's whether that is an acceptable position. If it's not an acceptable position, then the government may find it's having to do more subsidy. So there's quite a complex um, discussion going on. I think it's also likely that we will see regulation that says um, if you've got a natural monopoly, you have to be open access. Now, GigaClear's position has always been fairly clear, I think, where we do have our own vertically integrated ISP, but that was not out of choice. The intention was always to be a complete open access provider. Um, we needed a scale before the big service providers would deal with us. Um, and we're perfectly open to any ISP to come and have a conversation with us. 
At the moment, that's not necessarily true of the whole market, but I suspect it's going to have to be. And in fact, we're starting to see some hints in this in some of the other regulation that's coming through. So the universal service obligations, which I have to say the media has not done a good job in describing particularly well. Um, the universal service provider is effectively a retail service provider of last resort. If you've got poor broadband, this service provider will have no choice to go and find you an answer. Um, but it has to be delivered in what they term as economically efficient, which means it may not be their own infrastructure they, they're doing it on. Now, if you're an alt-net that isn't a universal service provider, and you make it difficult for people to find out where your services are and don't like people coming on your network, you're going to find that that universal service provider is legally obligated to overbuild you. So there's some levers of, sort of gentle encouragement, if you like, to be more open access. Um, and there's currently a consultation um, on the, the, the Ofcom Connected Nations report was out, I think, yesterday. They're now consulting on the future ones, which is looking at turning it from a periodic report into something that becomes an online API and becomes real time effectively. And they're talking about publishing that data, anonymizing it. And from our perspective, partly because of this, we're encouraging it to at least um, operators to elect to have their information published so that. Um, whoever the universal service provider is, they can easily find out that the two neighbours on either side are delivered by GigaClear, for example. And if you don't do that, you risk being overbuilt. You're making it too difficult for the market to find out. So, um, sort of wrap up. The yellow brick road to a copper sunset. Um, it's going to happen where there's widespread fibre already, where there's an established universal service provider able to make sure that nobody gets left behind, where there's a strong level of service competition. I think Ofcom is not going to allow the copper network to be turned off if the likes of Sky, TalkTalk and so on are denied from the market, and where the public service telephone network has already been turned off because all fibre, you can only do IP. And I suspect it will also start in rural areas first. I think there's a real risk for government that if copper networks are turned off in the urbanmost areas first, you may be left with a BT copper infrastructure in the rural areas that is loss making and uneconomic, and the government may, may be, sort of find themselves in an awkward situation where they may even have to consider nationalizing the rural copper network to wind it down. So I suspect we're going to see the rural areas um, prioritised. Um, and if I was a betting man and asked to guess when this is going to start, I suspect early trials may start much sooner than we think. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if some areas, early, tentative, slow, cautious trials, start as early as late 2020 into 2021. Universal service is due to start in 2020, I think, once that's established, if there are areas where it looks safe to do it, I wouldn't be surprised to see trials start as early as that. So that was quite a rattle through, but uh, if anybody has any questions. Hi, Mike Thompson. That was really quite interesting. Um, in the case of IP delivered telephony, mm. which is increasingly common, I'm sure I have some experience of myself, the question occasionally comes back from the householder as to what do we do when the power fails and I want to make an emergency call. Yeah. Now, you can say to the householder, well, you need to have a UPS of some sort to support your um, terminal device, whatever that may be, and your IP phones, whatever they may be. <coughs> it seems, however, it's, it's often lost in the general euphoria about how wonderful IP is. Another question which often gets asked, because if you do indeed lose power in a local area, you may well find that the local mobile phone masks go out as well, yeah. in which case the householder is then left with no means of contacting the outside world. Yeah. Where does this go? So, Ofcom is currently consulting on exactly that subject. Um, I think um, BT, for example, all of their IP NTEs are already battery-backed on FTTP. 
um, they're the only operator that's kind of morally obligated at the moment, if you like. Um, we're engaging very closely with that, and uh, I suspect we will get to a point where all of our NTEs are battery backed up, and we're talking with our ISPs about how we make sure their home hub type devices are also backed up. So I think we're going to get to a point. So Ofcom, for example, has said that um, anybody that's classed as a vulnerable customer, um, and that is in both in terms of some form of disability, for example, but also in terms of not being able to receive a 2G telephone call inside their house, we, the, the industry would be expected to battery back them for free. I think the cost of it and the complexity of interviewing a customer long enough to find out whether they're really disabled enough to justify, I suspect it's just cheaper to battery back up everything. Yeah, I, I, that, that's pretty well the view. I, if you indeed do battery back, so I've, I've seen the, the BT NTE devices uh, at one of my uh, own areas of interest. Um, there doesn't appear to be an apparent regime whereby the batteries get cycled in and out of the equipment as they reach the end of their working life, because you can do some maths on that, and assuming the customer was a competent to do it, you could send them batteries every seven or eight years. Yeah. Um, but if they're not, then you get into truck rolls. Yes. And I've never seen anybody model that cost-wise. No, and in fact, um, I believe Ofcom's position is that once it's been supplied, it's the customer's problem to maintain it. And I think, I might be wrong here, and this is still a, a, a work in progress. Um, if you look at BTs, I believe they stack, take standard rechargeable AA batteries, I believe. So they are fairly easily user, user replaceable, and it's that sort of market we're looking at at the moment. I suspect we'll end up in a similar place with the sort of warnings that you get on decked telephones and things today. Um, that it's up to you to maintain the batteries, and uh, here's your start of a 10. I have another question, if I may, Dave. <laughs> yes, carry on. You've okay, got yes, uh, uh, yeah, I suspect you know the answer to this one already. Um, in the case of the extreme rural um, distribution, um, discussions have taken place, I know, within GigaClear and, and with others too, about the use of wireless extension technology to reach beyond the end of the fibre to the solo farmhouse three kilometres up the road on top of the hill. Yeah. Um, do you see that as a likely permanent solution or just an interim fix till fibre finally makes it up to the top of the hill? Ooh. <laughs> so, GigaClear's position at the moment is fairly clear that we are a fibre operator. However, um, quite a few of the wholesale partners that we have on our network are wireless operators. And they, their business model is exactly that, that they're going, they're going to the places that we wouldn't fear, fear to tread. Um, you know, if you look at the geography of the UK, there's going to be areas that are always going to be hard to reach. You, you look at the, the, the worst outlying areas of the, the highlands of Scotland, for example. It's going to have to be a mixed environment. I can't... It will be a very, very long time and a brave person that says we're going to get to 100% full fibre. I'm done. Thank you very much, Colin Phillips. Um, a little bit about a question about your technical architecture. I think you mentioned it's point-to-point -point rather than GPON. Could you expand on that a little bit, please? So, um, when you're building a rural fibre network, by far the most expensive bit is digging the hole. How much fibre you throw in it is kind of neither here nor there at the end of the day. Um, so a point-to-point -point architecture gives you much more flexibility in the future the most expensive thing would be to put in a, a high split ratio pond network and then have to go and dig it out again. Um, so it's just easier to put in a point-to-point -point architecture. Now, at an active layer, that doesn't preclude putting the splitters in the cabinets and moving to that kind of architecture. That's not where we are at the moment, but it could well happen. And to supplement, if I may, what kind of speeds do you offer and what do you think the future holds for increases in speeds? What, so, what's the demand like? Um, Depending on whether you're talking to the ASA or Ofcom, um, we, we deliver a gigabit service, Ethernet Connect speed today. Um, because of the packet overhead and all the rest of it, the ASA says that has to be something like 940. Um, that's 
just sort of base technology on Ethernet these days, so every connection automatically has a connect speed of a gigabit for us. Um, we will look at, in fact, we are looking at multi-gigabit services. That would mean a, uh, essentially a truck roll to 10 gig Ethernet or above. Uh, I can see that happening. I think things like NGPON also make that relatively, uh, you know, a seamless glide path as well. Um, it's one of those things, isn't it? I can't see why anybody would want 10 gig to their house. Um, What's the I'm not going to say they won't have it. <laughs> Nobody will ever need more than 640k in their computer. Exactly. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> we certainly have Roger customers Dale, that yeah. know how to max out a gigabit. Thank you. Uh, I have raised this one before because it, uh, I'm an extreme rural person. <laughs> um, what I have uh, is a local exchange, uh, which is probably about four miles from uh, a reasonable size exchange, and it served a thousand lines local farms, little, a couple of little villages, but the villages probably 20 to 30 houses each. Uh, BT uh, have taken the money and they've activated this 1,000 line exchange. It's full fibre enabled. Yeah. And indeed, the fibre is there, coiled up on top of their telegraph poles, but not connected. <laughs> so they've taken the money and run, basically. Yeah. And the question really is... Is that actually going to stop guys like you effectively going into that marketplace? They've already taken the subsidies. Um, we, the only thing, the only areas we don't tend to overbuild will be full open access, full fibre networks. So, yeah, arguably, it may. Um, certainly, from our position, when we build a network, we put a pot right outside everybody's house. Um, and um, they can then be installed you typically within a week once the pot's there. Um, so we don't do the, uh, unless we can't get way leaves or there's some real painful problem, um, we don't coil ca cable in chambers and that kind of thing if we could help it. Um, I suspect what will start to happen is, so I know for example under things like BDUK programs they have quite clear definitions of what's classed as a home past and if, if you're BT does, if BDUK don't think that home is passed, they won't allow you to claim the money for it. That tends to focus operators' minds. Um, I honestly don't know what the relationship is or the, you know, the rules are within the community fibre type programme. Certainly as we would definitely finish the network and deliver the pots. <coughs> Microphone coming. <coughs> Thanks, Bill Petchy. Um, <coughs> After Brexit, presumably the state aid rules will get changed. Do you think that will, if that happens, will it unlock more funding from the government? Um, so in the various Brexit papers that have been released over the last few months, there was um, one specifically on state aid. And I think my understanding is that the government at the moment has no intention to change the state aid rules, largely because if they did, it'd have to come up with a set that looked broadly similar in order to comply with World Trade Organization rules. So they'll need something that delivers the same sorts of outcome. Um, so I think the only thing that they've really identified in the Brexit papers at the moment is that the ruling body won't be the EU anymore, it will be the Competition and Markets Authority. I think that's, if I've read it right, that's the only thing at the moment they're intending to change. Um, I doubt much will change, if I'm honest. Certainly not in the short term. Uh, John Van Breenen. Um <clears throat> Question, you, you alluded in your presentation um, to the use of an in-house developed uh, AI solution for design. Yeah. Um, could you Give us some more information on that, how, how, that, how that looks. And as a secondary question, maybe the uh, survey data that you get of your LIDAR um, uh, surveys, how do you import that into that solution? Right, so at the moment, they're, they're kind of two, the, the LIDAR solution and getting the data back, um, we hold as a separate system at the moment, largely because we need a very large data set to be able to start throwing machine learning and things at it to be able to, to automatically discern things like scars on the road. So at the moment they're two different systems. 
Um, the design system, it basically started out as um, a pure old-fashioned mathematical algorithmic approach um, that rapidly found the same problems as those commercial tools. So we started to develop a more heuristic approach to find a, um, a slightly suboptimal solution but in a manageable period of time. Mm -hmm. um, essentially all we do is we throw um, property data at it. Um, we have a database, that, so for example, ordnance survey address based type data. Um, we load in ordnance survey data, which is then classified for surface types. So it identifies roads, footpaths, uh, road verges, field verges, um, woodland, lakes, and all those kinds of things. So we don't find ourselves trying to mole plow a lake. Um, that's then set against contractor rate cards. So that um, different contractors might actually generate a different design. So for example, if you've got a contractor that's very cost effective at mole plow but expensive at trenching in the road, and another one that's actually doing you know, very quick, cheap micro trenching um, in the carriageway, it will generate different outcomes. So it's, um, it's optimized based on the contractor um, capability and um, technique mix. Um, at that level at the moment, it is somewhat dependent on ordnance survey data being up to date and the British Geological Survey data being up to date. Um, but that gives us something in the order of about a 90% accurate design at the moment. Um, to make it scale and to incorporate more levels of heuristics, if you like, without losing the quality. Um, that was why we started to imp import more AI and uh, machine learning techniques so that we could actually incorporate more variables and bring them into, into the model um, without losing the um, accuracy. Is that helpful? Certainly is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was Thank most you. interesting. I'm sure everybody